Praise the Lord this morning. Hope you're all doing well today. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. And uh, for those of you watching on live stream, most of our people are still eating coffee and donuts in the lobby, but we're going to get started and worship the Lord together. And uh, we're ex- happy to be in, entering into the presence of the Lord today. So if you're, why don't you go ahead and stand those of you in the, in the room today, why don't we lift our voices, lift our hearts, lift our hands to the Lord. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we magnify your name today. God, we exalt you because of who you are. We've come to give you glory and honor and praise, Jesus. We magnify your name, we magnify your name. And why don't we worship the Lord with the praise team as they lead us into the presence of the Lord.
about this probably a few months ago but there is a a truth about love that it is a choice that we make it is a decision oftentimes that we live out and in any kind of human relationship the emotions they fluctuate up and down they're cyclical you may be married and sometimes your spouse doesn't like you or you like your spouse but you're committed to one another it's also like that with God and our relationship with God that we kind of sometimes go through seasons where things are not always as good or we have those feelings, our emotions. And, and, and while I know that God is not a man, as the Bible says, and it's, he's not in a relationship like people are, but there is an element of truth that it shouldn't be just a decision we make to follow Jesus Christ. And we just live out our choice and just live out our decision, but we should have affection and love and adoration and appreciation for the God whom we serve. Anybody feel that way today about the God whom you serve, that you, you love Him? It's, not, it's a feeling. It's not just a choice. It's not just a decision, but you're, you're really in love with the God of the universe. Why don't you give Him praise one more time? thankful to be in his presence we want to go to the Lord in prayer today if you have a prayer request we'd love to take that need to the Lord together you can text us uh, that prayer request you can use the word pray text it to 888-238-2134 and then you'll be able to get a form back where you can then fill out what it is that you would like us to pray for of course you all are aware of all of the things going on in our world today whether it's COVID-19 whether it's the continued racial tension and uh, we want to pray for all of those does anybody just have a need though that you want to make known by lifting up your hand today you don't have to tell us what it is I know people are in the process of making decisions on various things and we want to go to the Lord in prayer with you today so why don't we go to the Lord in prayer right now for all of these things Jesus we love you today we thank you that we can bring our needs and our petitions before you God we thank you that you hear us when we pray that when we ask anything according to your will, your word tells us that you hear us. And if you hear us, we have what we ask. And Lord, we pray that you would bring healing, or not only physical healing, but emotional healing, racial healing to our nation today. Let the power of your spirit, let the power that is at work in this world, let it minister. Lord, I pray that you would change hearts and lives. Do it right now by your great power. And Lord, every need represented in this room today, I pray that you would meet those needs, that you would give clarity, that you would help people to make the right decisions. Let your will be done and accomplished in their lives. And we thank you for it, and we give you praise. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap one more time. God bless you. You may be seated. We are in the habit of when people get, get baptized or receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that we give them certificates just to acknowledge that event, acknowledge that God has been doing uh, something great in their lives. And during the middle of our shutdown where we weren't able to have in-person services, I was privileged to do a Zoom Bible study with uh, the Gassman family, and I had started a Bible study with Bill prior to all of the shutdown, and then he began to witness to his family and talk to his family about the things of God, and so we did a Bible study on Zoom, and at the end of that Bible study, they decided that they 
wanted to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And so we're so thankful that, that God is at work in their life. And so after, after our April 26th live stream, they actually joined us here. We baptized them, almost froze them a little bit in the water. But it's not about the temperature of the water. It's about what God does. And Jesus was at work, and he took away their sins and washed away their sins. And we're so thankful for what he's doing in their life. And I'm going to give these certificates. I'll walk over there so you guys don't need to come up. But Bill, so glad for what God is doing in your life. And Ann, so glad what Jesus did. And then Adrian and Aubrey. Yeah, that's right. Give them a hand. God bless you. Thank you. And just so you know, I, I will, the second Sunday of the month, we typically we try to highlight evangelism, and we have a couple of things we're going to do, so I'm going to forego most of that. But I would just tell you this, that Bill is not just sitting idly by, but he's been witnessing to his family in two different states. And uh, Lord willing, in the next little bit, we'll be doing some online Bible studies with them and they've already begun, begun to read the word of God and uh, I'm looking forward to them driving down here we baptize them in the name of Jesus for the remission of their sins and then get them plugged into a church back where they live so God is good I'm going to give you an opportunity to give today you can text the word give to 888-238-2134 or you can visit crosschurchkc.com slash give of course, we're not putting out envelopes, but if you have cash or check, uh, you can also deposit that in the buckets by the entrance to the building or the sanctuary. So while you're giving and before they sing one more song, we're going to do a little bit of a, a video presentation here. And this is our, our first uh, season where we're able to do this, the graduation season, and so we are going to a little video tribute today to our kindergarten, eighth grade, and high school graduates. So it's just under four minutes. So why don't you watch and enjoy this? And then following that, we'll do one more worship song and then enter into the preaching of the word. We will restart this. We do have audio that is currently not working. But I tell you what, we're going to restart it. Even if we don't get the audio, Kim, if you would just play through it if the audio doesn't come up.
we're thankful for his presence today. The Bible tells us that the, the Spirit of God is just the down payment. It is the earnest of our inheritance. And then when we get into his presence, it's just a little glimpse of what it's going to be like to spend eternity with him. Why don't we stand together one more time, and would you just lift your hearts, your voices, your hands one, once again, and would you love the Lord Jesus? We magnify your name today. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you for who you are and for all that you're doing in us. Thank you, Lord, that we can feel and experience and encounter your presence today. We give you praise. We give you praise. We're excited today for the return of children's ministry, and we're doing that a little bit uh, different than we have been to make it uh, socially distant, or at least the ability to do that. And so if you are participating in children's ministry, you can uh, exit out this door uh, for the children and in the nursery we'll just go and go out that door there so it's closer for them that are going to be over there and we're so glad that uh, you've been with us during worship now we're going to get into the preaching of the word today i'm going to turn your attention to ephesians chapter four and it's been i guess since march was the last time we were in ephesians looking at uh, the book of ephesians the letter that paul has written and so we're going to pick up at the beginning of chapter 4, finished up at the end of chapter 3, and then COVID-19 hit, and so we've been on a little bit of a hiatus, but we're back in Ephesians reading chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 in the New Living Translation. It says this, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. And so today, I'm going to preach for a little bit on this thought, called to be one, called to be one. God bless you, you may be seated. We have a phrase that is on our, our money, it's on our coins, it is called Eurobus Unum. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. You've seen it on there. It's a Latin phrase that means out of many comes one. Or sometimes people say it the opposite way, one out of many. And so it, it was first brought about in, in our nation because we had 13 colonies that were going to unite together to become these United States. And of course now we're at 50 uh, states and, and territories. And, but at that beginning, taking these 13 individual colonies who had individual and unique religious beliefs, there were states that were only Catholic, or states that were only Quaker, or states that were primarily Anabaptist, and they, even though we were supposed to have freedom of religion, it wasn't necessarily always the, that, the case, depending on which state you were going to, and the state of Georgia was kind of where everybody, that were, they were prisoners, they were sent there. And all of these different things that took place, and you had all of these diverse beliefs, and all of these people that had come from various parts of the world looking for freedom. And the great American experiment is such that taking those 13 colonies and figuring out a way in which they could work together and could become one. Now, I realize the, the Independence Day is, is still a, about three weeks away, and so I'm not going to get too much more into that. But the idea, though, is that taking 13 diverse colonies, 13 diverse states, as it were, and taking them and figuring out a way to unite them together to become one. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, it's the apex of many would say of, of his ministry. It's just before the Passion Week, or just before the Passion, it's actually during that week, and, and he makes a prayer 
and he prays a prayer. And in the course of that prayer, he is praying for oneness. He is praying for unity. He's standing there and he's looking at 12 unique individuals, 12 people that have different personalities and different temperaments, one of which who would betray him in the coming days. And he said this, he says, Father, I pray that they would be one, even as we are one. He's looking for these 12 to become united together. And, and, and think about it, they're all Jews. They're all from a very, uh, a relatively small area. But even amongst just those 12 that have similar backgrounds, and maybe they have different vocations and some fishermen and a tax collector, and, and, but there's, there's not that much. They're all Jews. They were all raised with the same religious background and the same primary culture. And he looks at them and he says, I pray that you become one. Because what Jesus knew is that anytime you have people, you have problems. And when you get people together, you just multiply your problems. And these 12, he's like, you need to be one. You need to be united. And he prayed a prayer for them. And by extension, he prayed that prayer for us. And, and now we have much more diversity and much more, uh, uh, more different backgrounds and religious beliefs that have all trying to come together into the body of Christ to become one. We need to be one. We need the many to come together to become one in the body of Christ. And unfortunately, even within the body of Christ, there are people who have not really achieved oneness. They're not striving to be one. They bring, unfortunately, division many times instead of unity. But the true church of Jesus Christ should be a church that is united, a church that is one, that has one mind and one goal and one passion, and that is to see the lost saved, and that is to see Jesus Christ glorified. So I was thinking through kind of what this looks like, and, and you know, God is, before I give you this analogy, God is bigger than COVID-19, and He's bigger than all of this, and and God's bigger, of course, than Cross Church, but maybe, just maybe, God knew all that was going to be going, happening right now in our world. That He knew about the, the racial tension, He knew about the, the lack of oneness that we have, and the need that we have in this day and hour. And, but He has a way of taking all things and working them together for good. And so I, I finished our last service before COVID-19, I finished Ephesians chapter 3. And I just didn't feel like I could keep on going on that series. And now that we're back and we've had a couple of serv unique services, we had missionary last week and we had Pentecost Sunday and we had a few unique services as we gathered back, that God knew this was going to happen. And so maybe it's orchestrated that this is the passage that is for this time and this hour that we need. Aren't you glad that God knows the end from the beginning? Aren't you glad that he knows all things? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. But, so I was thinking about this analogy, and unfortunately for those of you who don't like sports, I, I like sports. Therefore, I have a lot of sports analogies that I just make up. And It's possible for people to be on the same team, that they can all wear the same jersey. Whatever your favorite team is, they're a team. They're, they're, they're wearing the same jersey. They, they have unique skill sets, and they have unique positions that they play. And, and, and a team can somewhat be on the same page. They can know, all right, now it's time for us to be on offense, or it's time for us to be on defense. But with any team, they have a multitude and a multiplicity of Plays. They don't just run the same play. They don't run the same defensive scheme. They don't run the same running play. It may be off tackle or it may be between the tackles or whatever, all the different fancy things that they do. And if you're a Chiefs fan, you know, it works. And you just, whatever that play was that really helped them to win the Super Bowl that nobody thought would work. And Mahomes just pulled it out and there, there was Tyreek Hill 40 yards down the field. And, and it just worked. But even if you're on the same team and you, and you know that you're on offense or defense, that's not enough. You have to be on the same play. That if you go out there and you think it's a running play, 
and you're an offensive lineman and you're just taking exploding off the line and you're, you're pushing your guy back, but it's a pass play, guess what? It's going to be an eligible man downfield. You have to be not just on the same team and on the same side of the ball, but you have to be on the same play. And as the church of Jesus Christ, it's not enough just to say that we're Christians. It's not even enough to say, well, we believe the same things, but we have to act the same way that we need to show and demonstrate the character and nature of Jesus Christ in everything that we do, in every way and in every aspect. That doesn't mean that we don't mess up. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes, but we need to strive to be on the same play, running the same play, doing our part to push the ball down the field and, and the, the ball of evangelism and to see people saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in this passage, Paul has just concluded a whole long list of indicatives. An indicative is just a statement of fact. He's, he's had a whole long list of things that he says that God has done and we're we're saved and we're sitting together in heavenly places and by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And, and he ends chapter 3 with talking about the God who can do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That God is at work in us, and He's done all of these great things. He's saved us, and He's done all these wonderful things. And then He transitions, and He uses the word, therefore. Because God has done all of this stuff, there's something that you have to do. Because God has saved you, there's something that you need to do. Because God has given you His grace, now there's something that you have to do. God is requiring something of us because of what he has done and i don't think it's too far afield to say that he starts with unity because maybe that's the most difficult thing to achieve and because god has saved us and he, he saved you and he saved you and he saved you and he saved you and he saved me now we're supposed to be doing something and getting together in unity is difficult and he starts with this call to be one and then everything else can flow out of that we can now if we're together if we're one we can then do all of the things that god has called us to do so there are a number of different ways that he speaks of this oneness. The first is this, he says, we have one source of our calling. In verse 1, he says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. God is the one who calls us into relationship with Himself. God is the one that it wants us to bring us into salvation. God is the one who is at work and is doing that. You and I don't get to call ourselves. I don't get to call you, and, and your neighbor doesn't get to call you. You don't get to call me. God is the one who does the calling. That doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to share the gospel. But when we share the gospel and people receive it, it's because God has been at work and God has been calling them and God has been trying to get them in a relationship with Him. We have one source of our calling. And this calling for Paul, it led him to be a prisoner, both figuratively and literally. He's writing this from a jail cell. He's writing this because of persecution. He's waiting for his execution and he writes this and he says I'm a prisoner I'm really a prisoner but there's also a figurative aspect of that and that is this is that all of us are in essence prisoners because we have been bought with a price we now belong to Jesus Christ and when we belong to him we're a prisoner to do his will and to do what it is that he is calling us to do and he says we need to live worthy of our calling. Walking worthily begins with understanding those things that unite us and make us one. 
And that starts with understanding that it is the same God who calls us. And that if you're going to be saved, it's not a different God, it's one God. And that same God who loved you enough to bring you into relationship with Him and loved you enough to bring you into relationship with Him. He loves everybody and He's trying to bring people into relationship with Him and unite them together for His cause and His purpose. We have one source of our calling. And then verse 2, we have one attitude toward each other. Well, let me say it this way. We're supposed to have one attitude toward each other. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humility. Probably not my strongest point. For many people, it's not their strongest point. <laughs> I'm glad y'all didn't amen that that wasn't my strongest point. I, I was trying to be humble and tell you that I had trouble with humility. And I, I appreciate you not agreeing with me too loudly anyway. But humility is not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Not thinking that you're better than somebody else. Not thinking that you're up here and they're down here. And, and, and I, I'm prone to, to not, not as prone as Joe Biden to make gaffes. So, so just take this in, in the spirit in which it's offered. But if more people walked around in humility, we wouldn't have the racial issues that we have today. That everybody would look at some, their, their neighbor and go, man, they're, they're as good as me, or maybe they're better than me. Just because I, I know my faults, and I know what's wrong with me, and we walk around that humility is saying, I'm not better than them, and we're elevating other people at the same time. That it, He has called us to walk in humility and to interact with one another in humility. And regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds or ethnicity, whatever that happens to be, Humility says, there but for the grace of God go I. That if it wasn't for God's grace, I, I, I may be in prison. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I would be destitute and I would be homeless. But when we walk around in humility, we say, it's only by His grace. And, and God, no matter where they are, God is calling them to and He wants them to be in relationship with Him. Humility. Gentleness. Always be gentle. It's hard to do sometimes when you're angry. It's hard to do sometimes when people do things you don't like. But he called us to have this attitude of humility and this attitude of gentleness and an attitude of patience, to be patient with each other. They're not like me. Patience. They're different. I don't get it. I don't understand this or I don't understand that. To be patient. To be tolerant. New Living Translation, translation that I read said making allowance for each other's faults. Other versions say to be diligently tolerant. When somebody is doing something you don't like or somebody's different than you and you don't understand or you don't fit in. Making allowance for their faults and sometimes it's not just their faults, it's just different. And there's nothing wrong with it, it's just different. But when we have the attitude that, hey, God loves them and God wants them saved and they are being called into the same body as I have been called, the same church as I have, guess what? Jesus said, I pray that they be one. Let them be one. Do it, he said in verse 2, because of your love. Love covers, the Bible says, a multitude of sin. When you love people, you overlook their faults. You don't leave them in their sin, but you don't bash them because of their sin. Love says, no matter what they've done, Jesus loves them, and I love them. And I'm going to do what's best for them. Love does what is best for others, and it's not just what's best for me. 
And I preached about that a few months ago, so I won't do any more. But it is this attitude that we need to have toward one another of humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance and love. And then he says we have one source of our unity. One source. We're called by one. We have one attitude. We're to have one source of our unity, making every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. It is the Spirit of God that unites us together. It's not a location. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. It's not an ethnicity. It's not a socioeconomic status. We have one thing that unites us, and that is the Spirit of God. That when you have the Spirit of God, you become and you go into a relationship with Him. It is the Spirit that makes us part of the same family. The Spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That you've been adopted into the same family that I've been adopted into. And you've been adopted into the same family that we've been adopted into. And when we have that spirit, we're all part of the same family and we're all saying, Abba, Father. I preached about this a few, I preached a lot a few months ago, <laughs> sounds like. But, but I, I preached from Romans. And, and I used this in one of my messages that, that when Paul, he's talking about this spirit of adoption, and, and he's been talking about Israel, and, and he starts off with these, these concentric circles, and he says, not all of Abraham's seed is, are saved. And he goes into the fact that there's Isaac and there's Ishmael, and it, but the, the descendants of Ishmael, they're not saved, but Isaac's seed, his offspring, they're the ones who are saved. And then he says, but not all of Isaac's descendants are saved. He's got Jacob and Esau, Jacob whom I've loved and Esau whom I've hated. So it's this Jacob and his descendants that are now part of the chosen line, the part of the people of God. And he walks all of this through. And he creates this distinction between Jew and Gentile. And ultimately he says, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, all have sinned. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 6 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he says, all of us have sinned and all of us have the same salvation. Then he gets into the spirit of adoption where we're brought into one family. And I think that what he's doing when he says, Abba, Father. He's talking about our differences. Abba, it's the Aramaic for, for Father. But Romans isn't written in Aramaic, it's written in Greek. But he writes an Aramaic word that the Jews primarily, or many of them are speaking, it's what they're writing in, and he sticks that in along with the Greek word pater, which means father. And he says, we cry, Abba, Father. So whether you're Jew, you call him Abba, whether you're Gentile, you call him Pater. He says we both are calling him Father. He has brought us together with the spirit of adoption, and he has made us one, and it is his spirit that unites us together. It is the spirit of God that is the source of our unity. To be united means that we walk in peace. He says binding yourselves together with peace. I don't think it's any accident the way Paul uses language here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. There's another time when Jesus talked about peace and he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Walk in peace because it produces unity, because we're the same family, and if you're a peacemaker, what are you in that family? You're a child of God when you, when you make peace and you, and you break down the barriers and, you, and you, you ease the tension and you ease the difficulty and you bring people together and reconcile them together. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children 
of God. Aren't you thankful to be a child of God today? Why don't you lift your hands and love Him right now? Jesus, we love you. We praise you, Jesus. Verse 4, he expands it out, and we have one church, one spirit, and one future. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. One body, it is speaking of the body of Christ, the church. And the true church, there is only one. That if you're part of the true church, whether you're part of a local assembly like this or, or whether you haven't ever made it to a, a local assembly, if you're really part of the church, there's only one. There's not a multitude of churches. There's a multitude of false churches, unfortunately, but there's only one true church. He says you are part of the one church body that body of Christ and it is that one spirit of God that is in all of us if you receive the spirit of God you don't receive a different spirit than somebody else there is only one Holy Spirit there's not a multitude of Holy Spirits there's not a multitude of spirits that God is passing out and God is filling people with it's only one there is one body and one spirit and he says when you have that guess what you only have one future and it is a glorious future of heaven with Jesus forever. One future. And it's, let me hurry. Verse 5 and 6. He tells us if, because we're united and we're one. He says there is only one God. Verse 5. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all and there's a lot to break down and i'll do it quickly as i can there is one lord and he's talking about the lord jesus christ that, that when we come into relationship with god we do it through the lordship of jesus christ no man comes to the father except through the son that you have to come through Jesus Christ. He is the door to the sheepfold. He is the one who sacrificed and gave his life for us. He is the one, the Bible says, he's the one that imparts the Holy Spirit. He is the one giving the Holy Spirit. It is one Lord Jesus Christ. There is, he says, also one faith. And here, faith is not used of just belief. It's not a, well, I believe something. It is not the process of believing, but it is the object on which you believe. And he says there is one faith. Jude would say this, that the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. It is one body of truth that doesn't change. That it was decided before time began and it was, it was preached and it was written down in the first century A.D., and it is still in effect today. There is only one truth. There is only one body of beliefs. There is one faith. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but I would just tell you this. It's that anything outside of the Bible is not part of that one faith. That anything outside of what the apostles were preaching and teaching is not part of that one faith. There is one method of salvation. And that is repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. There is only one way to be saved and there's only one means to get there. And that is through Jesus Christ. There is only one faith. He says there's only one baptism. And I know we talk about baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I walked through this a few weeks ago. But baptism... Of the Holy Spirit, it's the same as receiving the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he's already talked about the fact that we have this one Spirit. So here, he's really referring to there's only one water baptism. Water baptism is never called anything but baptism. There's, it's, not, it's not synonymous with anything else. It is the immersion and submersion in the name of Jesus Christ. There is only one baptism. There's only one manner and one way in which you do that, and that is to immerse people fully in water. And there's only one name that you call, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And there's only one time frame when you do it, and that's when you believe. 
and immediately after you believe, get baptized in the name of Jesus. If you don't believe, then all you do is get wet. You could do that at home in the shower or the bathtub. That's not baptism. But when you believe in Jesus and when you believe that He is the Son of God, what did, what did Philip say in Acts chapter 8 to the Ethiopian? The Ethiopian said, I want to be baptized. Here's water. And Philip said this. He says, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Philip said, let's do this thing. Let's get you baptized. That when you believe, then you're ready to be baptized. And why wait? Why, Terry, here's water. Let's do it whenever you believe. It's time to get baptized in the name of Jesus. And there is only one purpose for baptism, and that is the washing away and the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That baptism accomplishes what nothing else can do. It's God's plan. It's the way He ordained it. There is only one baptism. And then He ends this section with saying, There is one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Lord. There's not a multitude of gods. Paul's writing in a time where there is a pantheon of gods. The Greeks and the Romans, they have all kinds of gods. Whether it's the planets or gods that are over various pieces of nature or whatever, and they call all of these things gods and they worship them and they make sacrifice and offer incense incense to them but there is one God Deuteronomy 6 4 it is the foundation of the fact that there is only one God here O Israel the Lord your God is one In Isaiah 9 6 here he says that before I read that, but Paul said there's one God and Father of all. The prophet, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said unto us, a child is born, speaking of Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I don't have time to go into all the theological understanding of that, but let me just sum it up this way. There's no question who this passage is speaking of. Within Christianity, nobody questions. Nobody questions that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And nobody questions that He's a wonderful he's Counselor. But if He's all of that, that means He is also the Mighty God. And He is Everlasting Father. There is only one God and He fills all space and time. He is, as Paul said, over all, in all, and living in us all. That when you're filled with the Spirit of God, the one God of the universe comes down in the form of the Holy Spirit and it dwells your heart, changes and transforms us into what He wants us to be. Would you stand together? We are called to be one. We're called to be one because of all of these things. We have one source of our calling. We have one spirit that unites us. We have one body, the church. We have one God who is over all. 
in the nation that we live in continues to be torn apart. Another incident in Atlanta last night, I believe. And I'm sure there are those who don't want unity and don't want oneness. They, they want chaos. But what God wants is for His people to be one. His people to be united. And He wants His people to be united to preach the gospel. And so that everyone who hears the gospel and responds appropriately then they become united and they become one. It is the only solution for the world's problems is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and if we can't work together to get the job done, then we're not fulfilling His calling and His purpose. The Tower of Babel was unity gone wrong. Where well, they were all united around a common cause and, and you may have different views on this but I, I think the reality is what they were doing is not just trying to build a really tall skyscraper but they were building pagan temple a ziggurat that is trying to use that temple and that worship and that false worship to reach heaven and what God said is that everybody's united that means nothing is going to stop them. Nothing is going to come and, and keep them from doing the things that they're doing. It's like being in a mob. When everybody's united and they're doing the same thing, who's going to stop them? And that's what he says. He said, they're all united doing this. And so he says, I'll stop them. That's unity gone wrong, but the book of Acts is unity done right. They weren't without their problems. They didn't have a few discussions and a few squabbles. And you see Paul and Peter a couple times, they, they butted heads, but ultimately they were united because Jesus prayed, let them be one. And the entire world heard the gospel in roughly 40 years. Now some 2,000 years later, how many people still haven't heard the gospel? How many people don't really know the name of Jesus Christ? But we can only reach our world if we unite with the gospel of Jesus Christ and we work together as one. The one body of believers that God has called us to be. I don't know about you, but I want to be one with my brothers, one with my sisters, one in my beliefs and one with the Father and one walking to see people saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you as they get, begin to sing this song, once again, as I did a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, just step out from where you are, maintain social distancing, and just to make sure everybody stays safe and comfortable. But would you may take a step of faith and say, God, I want to be one. I want to be what you called me to be. Yes, Lord, I want to be everything you called me to be, Jesus. Make us one flame to proclaim. Your name and take us one. That's your desire. Would you make this song your prayer to be one today? Oh, make us one. Make us one. Make us one. Make us one. Let your be one with you, Jesus. Make us one heart. Make, make us one mind. Make, make us, us one. Let your will be done. Make, make us one flame to proclaim your name. you may be here today.
today or watching online and you're not totally sure your relationship with Jesus Christ. But you can make that relationship sure today. Just know that He loves you. Know that He went to the cross for you to be to bring you into relationship with Him. And He was resurrected the third day and in the book of Acts He poured out the Holy Spirit. That promise that He put out He said you can have it. In fact you need to have it. And when the Spirit comes the examples in the book of Acts are that they begin to speak with other tongues a language they don't know. And and many of you in here, if not most of you, you've experienced that. But if you haven't, I encourage you to seek God. Seek the promises that He's made. Don't seek to speak in tongues. Seek Him. And when He comes, that will happen. Would you lift your hands wherever you are? Would you just begin to talk to Him today, Jesus? I love you. Thank you for what you've done, Lord. Thank you that you want us to be in unity and oneness. And I pray, Lord, that you would baptize everyone in this room with the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, that your Spirit would come and live on the inside. Lord, would you make that prayer today? If you haven't received the Spirit, would you just begin to pray that God would do that in your life? us to be salt and light. Help us to be the people that you have called us to be. Lord, I pray that as part of the body of Christ, that just in this local assembly, that you would help us to be united and be one with you and with one another. But also, Lord, I pray that you help us to be one with the broader church, that you would help us to be united with we would have that proper attitude toward one another of humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance and love. Make us one, I pray, so that you would be glorified, that the world would be saved. Make us one. She continues to sing. God bless you. Thank you for being here. You can fellowship in here. You can continue to pray. Fellowship in the lobby. Uh, if you need to take off, we want to take uh, some pictures of the, our regular attenders today. So we'd love to be able to do that before you exit the building. God bless you. Thank you for being here. To proclaim your name. Because